Welcome to the latest installment of our NASA Citizen Science Leader Series. I'm your host, Sarah Kern, from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in beautiful Portland, Maine. And we are in live Zoom meeting mode today. We've given you full powers in the chat space so you can introduce yourselves and ask questions there. And we're going to keep you muted so that we can all better hear our speaker, Dr. Andrea Grover will be joining us just as soon as her teaching responsibilities allow. She's finishing up a class right now. I also want you to know that we are recording this event for reuse and posting online. By staying with us, you are agreeing to that and you're also agreeing to abide by our code of conduct. I'd like to extend a special welcome today to the teams from the newly funded NASA Citizen Science Projects and to the folks from the Citizen Science Association. We're really happy to have all of you with us. We're also joined today, as usual, by the one and only Dr. Mark Kushner, NASA's citizen science officer and a practitioner in his own right. He is the founding scientist of both Disk Detective and Backyard Worlds Planet Nine, two very popular and very productive projects on Zooniverse. Mark, thank you for your support of and your participation in this series. It's great to be with you here once again. Over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much for all the work that you've done and the whole planning team has done to get our band back together. It is great to stay connected with you all during these strange times we live in and to take advantage of the brain power that's well connected to us all around us these days and eager for meaningful citizen science experiences. Um, I'll just mention that there, as we were just talking about, uh, ahead of the meeting, We've got some really cool NASA missions coming up. And every time there's a NASA mission that launches, there's an opportunity for more creative citizen science ideas. Uh, these data sets just keep getting bigger and the science the world just keeps getting more interconnected. Um, and uh, so I hope you'll be thinking about citizen science project ideas to do with them. And also every time there's a mission launch, there's a cross promotion uh, possibility for for us if you have science that is related to the science theme of the mission that comes up we can um, make a tie-in and we can take an opportunity to drive traffic to your site and help you get more of your science done uh, so please think about those angles too uh, so the three missions i want to mention um uh, landsat 9 just just launched uh, but coming up, we have um, Lucy launching this mission to the Trojan asteroids. If you have any project that is related to asteroids, comets, even maybe Jupiter, we know about you. Um, I have a list of projects like that in mind, but those guys, folks who are doing that, you know who you are. Um, you know, think of some creative tie in that's connected to Trojans. I'm sure that there are a couple of Trojans that leaked into your sample. Um, Right. Um, send me a note or or submit a, a news feed item uh, to Maria um, and and let's cross promote. Uh, next coming up, there is the um, Dart mission, also on the theme of asteroids. That's the uh, the mission that's going to crash itself on purpose into an asteroid and try to change the orbit of the asteroid by a little bit. I guess it's a little harder to tie in, but once again, asteroid theme. And then um, uh, looking further down the road, James Webb Space Telescope. And JWST is looking for, um, has a whole system for recruiting uh, experts who would like to talk about James Webb science. And as you know, James Webb science covers just about every single topic in astronomy. Uh, and James Webb has specifically told me that they would love for citizen scientists to sign up to be, um, be these experts and go and give presentations or put, be interviewed by the media or just generally uh, show off their brains and their their passion. And um, uh, so, so that's something to think about too. And I'll hand the mic back to Sarah. Thanks everyone. Super. For Thank you, Mark. So today, today's event, which will be a keynote talk by Dr. Andrea Grover, is the kickoff event for two related efforts, one in the NASA citizen science community and one in the Citizen Science Association. On the NASA side, today's event kicks off a three-part series that has a focus on data and the clear purpose 
of creating collaboratively outlining a NASA citizen science data primer to serve as a resource to the leaders of NASA citizen science projects, regardless of which science division they are in or what funding supports them. So after today's keynote, we're going to read and discuss a really relevant and wonderful white paper authored by a group of NASA Earth Science Citizen Science Project PIs, some of whom are still active members of this community and with us today and with us for this series. And apart from that, we're counting on each of you to share what you know in order to compile our outline of all the data issues that ought to be considered when creating a new citizen science project or when reviewing the data practices of an existing one. We also will start compiling a list of the resources to help projects respond to these data issues. We're not just flagging the issues and leaving you hanging. While we in the NASA citizen science community are working on our primer, the Citizen Science Association is pursuing their own parallel citizen science data conversation through the month of October. Here to tell us a little bit more about that and about the Citizen Science Association itself are Jennifer Shark and Rihanna Putnam. Jennifer, starting with you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and it's really exciting to see these two things happening together. And even though they're happening in parallel, they don't have to be separate. And this series is one example of how we can have a great collaboration across communities to advance big ideas in how we do this work. And Sarah, you, you and Mark have been doing that through this series, providing a space where NASA PIs and champions of NASA projects can learn together and exchange ideas and questions and tackle some of those challenges and opportunities. CSA, the Citizen Science Association, has many similar intentions to what you've been doing here for the NASA community, but it's a broader community of practitioners. We're a member-driven nonprofit association with a community that spans a wide range of disciplines and also different sectors where this work takes place. So some of the things that we do are to support projects um, that achieve many kinds of outcomes. And of course, they're projects that have data and research at the heart, which NASA really emphasizes, but also projects that advance environmental justice and education and policy change. Any of these things that can come from real world research collaborations. And in each of these communities, there's a lot of power in the cross-pollination of ideas. CSA really tries to break down silos in ways that can accelerate um, project growth and ways that can help projects efficiently, efficiently reach their goals so that we can all learn from each other and make sure that we're exchanging and accelerating innovation. And I just want to give you a couple of examples. So at one of our very first conferences, which is one of the things that CSA does, I was part of a conversation where one of my ornithologist colleagues, Karen Cooper, was inspired to be an early adopter of the Zooniverse platform originally designed for astronomy. So this, this cross-pollination, this exchange of approaches can really help us do work in new ways, no matter what discipline we're in. And in addition to that, one of the primary reasons that CSA came into being and a role that we've been pleased to parallel through this NASA partnership is to help everyone tap into the knowledge across the many different areas of work that it takes to run these projects. So not just across disciplines, um, but across those different areas of expertise. Sometimes it can feel like we have to be an expert in everything um, but we don't have to be alone in doing this. So some of the things that we do at CSA is uh, publish work in our journal that can connect potential collaborators from fields like human computer interactions or volunteer engagement or around ethical data practices and much, much more. So one distinct different sector that CSA has in our community um, although I, don't, I wouldn't say that this is missing from NASA, but a really distinct sector that we have beyond folks who are doing excellent work in innovating and leading projects, CSA engages people who study this field and who bring attention to the practices that are proven to work. And over the series, our role in part has been to work with Sarah and Mark to bring top level field leaders from all of these different perspectives into this series. And that includes folks like Julia Parrish and Raj Pandya, Shakobi Wilson, 
Martin Storksteek, just to name a few. And today's talk by Andrea Grover is another one in that vein, and it's really going to be great. Sarah's going to introduce her in a bit, but she's someone I know I've known for a very long time, and who has done foundational work in both uh, doing this work and uh, advancing how we think about what it takes to make it happen. So CSA is, is just a place where everyone can deepen connections to folks like that with both leaders and learners of these practices. And it's also a place that can benefit from NASA's distinct strengths and leadership in research in particular. This coming month, there's a really great opportunity for a focused convergence, as Sarah mentioned, as we all take a close look at data practices in particular. And I'm gonna ask Rihanna Putnam, who is CSA's community engagement specialist to share a little bit about some of the ways that we can exchange ideas, not just this month, but also beyond. Rihanna? Rihanna, you're muted. <laughs> Great, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Jennifer. So this fall, we're going to be diving into topics important to this field through guided conversations on CSA Connect. CSA Connect is a dedicated platform for citizen science leaders like you to share opportunities, resources, and insights to make your project stronger. We love this platform because it provides a space for our members to make the kinds of boundary spanning connections Jennifer mentioned earlier outside of annual conferences or meetings. We are wrapping up a month long conversation about evaluation where members shared examples of survey questions that worked, experience with culturally responsive evaluation, and got questions answered by expert evaluators in our research and evaluation working group. October, as Jennifer mentioned, is data month on CSA Connect. And we look forward to diving deeper into data quality, metadata standards, and other unique data concerns like how to combine staff collected data with volunteer collected data. Our data and metadata working group is leading this conversation and hosting an event to review the data quality resource compendium released by the group in spring 2020. The compendium features guidance documents, manuals, and workbooks produced for citizen science and is a treasure trove of resources. You can find out more about how to use this tool and how you can help update it in a discussion-focused event with members of the group's quality assurance and quality control project team on October 13th. Leaders from the CSA community, including co-chairs from our nine working groups, will be leading conversations every month on CSA Connect. Other topics coming up include volunteer engagement, ethical data practices, and data sovereignty. We're especially excited about the conversation about data ethics happening this winter, where, we'll, where we will premiere a data ethics toolkit, which is the culmination of a trustworthy data practices study done by researchers at North Carolina State University and UNC Charlotte in collaboration with CSA. I believe we have a couple of those researchers on the line today. I know I saw Lisa's name, Lisa Rasmussen and Lisa Jones um, are two of the PIs on that. And it's low stakes to join these conversations. Many of you who are NASA PIs and leaders are eligible for a free CSA membership this year. Check for an email from Sarah this morning for a promo code. And even if you're not, you can get a free trial month to join the data conversation on CSA Connect and service to data's, or NASA's fall data primer project by visiting connect.citizenscience.org. We look forward to hearing from you. We know you have something valuable to share. And now I'll hand it back to Sarah. Thanks, Rihanna, and thank you, Jennifer. And I'm so happy that Andrea has made it to join us. Um, so I hope everyone in the audience too picked up on that mention of the compendium and I dropped a link in the chat. Bookmark that, don't get lost in it right now. There's a lot to see in it. It's an incredible compilation of resources. Um, and if you have other things to add, there's a form right on the online where you can um, contribute something else to be added to it. And the primer that we're working on, we look forward to contributing to that um, resource as well. So now we get to hear from one of the wisest voices on the topic of citizen science data. Dr. Andrea Grover is an associate professor in information systems and quantitative analysis at the University of Nebraska at Omaha College of Information Science and Technology. Her work focuses on understanding the growing role and impacts of technology in citizen science. Her research highlights the design, management, and technology configurations that address the needs of diverse stakeholders in citizen science, and concurrently informs the development of systems and policies to support public participation in science. 
She was the lead author, or her work has contributed to the very foundation of citizen science. She was the lead author on the very first data management guide for citizen science through a fellowship with the Data One Initiative. She's been a frequent collaborator with other researchers in the citizen science community and is co-author on several of the most influential papers on citizen science project design and practice. Look for her publications, many under the name Andrea Wiggins. She advises citizen science programs across a range of disciplines from astrophysics to social sciences, as well as federal policy initiatives, initiatives which makes her a perfect speaker for today's event. We have set aside time at the end for a Q&A with Andrea. Please put your questions in the chat for that. And if you have questions while she's speaking and you want them um, to be saved for that Q&A, you can write in for Andrea or for speaker at the beginning of your question. So welcome, Andrea. And I think we have to make you unmute. And we have to give you the powers to present. Yes, thank you. There you are. Let me do that quickly. There. Awesome, thank you. Well, that was a lovely intro. I, I have to admit a, li a little bit like uh, intimidating, right? Uh, it's one of those reputation precedes you and some days I feel it's better earned than others, but it's true. I've done a lot of work on data related issues in citizen science. So it is delightful to be um, speaking with you today. Um, so I was told to kind of keep it short so we could spend most of the time on discussion. So I figured I'd start off with some things related to data that you might want on your radar as you're thinking about data practices. Um, some reasons that archiving data is a really great thing to do for your project and for your impact. Um, some ways to get started with that because it's probably one of the more, um, poorly understood pieces of sort of a data life cycle. And um, some points to consider around evaluation, since um, the most recent project I've been working on with a variety of the usual suspects in evaluation in citizen science um, is working a lot with the data that is produced um, by projects. So this has started to really become a, a pretty interesting piece of the picture for me. So we all know that there are some data quality challenges with citizen science. I like to say, you know, many hands make light work, but some of those hands are a little bit grubby. And so sometimes the data need a little bit more love or a different kind of attention to deal with those issues. But by and large, because this becomes the first thing that people use as an objection to public participation, um, we've kind of got that down in a lot of ways. And we have a lot of tools for dealing with the data quality issues and challenges. And so if it's something that like you're personally kind of struggling with, there are plenty of people in the community who can help with that, who have ideas and, and ways to move it forward. But there's some other data related issues that I feel like a lot of projects have yet to consider or haven't necessarily um, incorporated into their practices. Um, so one of the first pieces is attribution and acknowledgement. Um, these are actually different things, um, but we kind of lump them together because they're related to giving credit. There are no norms around giving credit. There are no standards. Um, participants do like to be recognized. However, not everybody wants to be recognized in the same way. Some people prefer not to be called out by name. So it's essentially a big unknown space where we have some examples of different ways it's been done, but almost nothing to really tell us what's the best way to do this. And my guess is the best way depends on the project and its goals and its needs and its participants, um, but we rarely formalize this or make it explicit for people. Um, when it comes to sharing and archiving data, which I'm told they, some of the NASA funded projects are required to do, which I think is fabulous, um, de-identification becomes important. You really can't separate the data from the people who generate it. Um, even if it doesn't look like they're there, they are there. Um, you should see what my graduate students can do with a Zooniverse data dump. It's a lot. <laughs> um, and so de-identification isn't just pulling out directly personally identifiable information like email addresses and names, but also usernames. Usernames are not actually anonymous. Some people put their real names in there. Some people um, make it pretty clear through their actions and statements who they are, and then that's findable later. And so while it might not be strictly required due to like Paperwork Reduction Act or Privacy Act or any of those kinds of constraints, 
it is a question of reasonable expectations of privacy on the part of participants. So if it hasn't been, if it wasn't like ex kind of described to them upfront that data would be shared and that their username would be on it, then you should assume that they don't think that's going to happen. And it might be a nasty surprise to them. So uh, de-identification can be as simple as substituting character strings for actual usernames so that you can track the behavior of an individual without being able to figure out which individual it is. And the reason that that's actually really valuable is that data about the people who do the science can help support the science. Essentially, all that behavioral data that can get embedded in a data set one way or another um, is a really interesting and useful ancillary data set. It's the kind of thing that I like get all excited about digging into. And it's also uh, useful for a variety of purposes. So I could point you to the 2015 paper by Steve Kelling and comrades on which I was on the author list for um, in biological conservation, I think, where we basically looked at eBird um, data to um, and looked at the performance of people based on what data they submitted. And that was a really fun study to do. And there were a number of uses that you could use for that kind of information. And we were able to kind of verify that it was a reasonable representation of people's skills or performance um, in doing the citizen science tasks. So you could use that to potentially weight um, a model according to uh, known skills of participants where the data is available for that, or um, actually to support like training or targeted interventions if you see people who are uh, really in need of feedback. So there's a number of ways that you can actually use that information. So don't throw it away, just don't make it public. Um, and then there's access to results. So it's part of the unspoken agreement with a lot of participants that they expect to see your work produce results. They're investing their time, they want it to come out to something. And so what that actually means is not an academic paper most of the time, right? That's the easy thing for us to turn over, but it takes forever. And that's not the language that most people speak. Um, so I think plain language and visual summaries are a really good way to address that. And that doesn't have to conflict with publication goals. Um, if it's conflicting with publication goals, you probably got like the level of specificity off a little bit because a general overview of results is probably enough to keep most people interested and excited. And if they want to know more, that's great. And you can say, this is our timeline for being able to get the next level of results to you, right? Um, the archive data also gives people access to results. Um, and so when that data becomes available to people, they can go and check it out for themselves, which is um, pretty awesome. Um, I know, well, since I work <laughs> in sort of higher ed, I, I know plenty of people who really love getting into the data, including many students who come from all walks of life. And um, they, they get so excited about an interesting data set. Um, so this is something that I think it's easy to overestimate how much utility it could have, partly because one of the challenges with archive data is we don't know what value it might have to someone else. So those are all secondary uses when somebody's picking up your data and running with it, but you can help expand on what's possible with that um, by supporting interoperability wherever standards are usable to um, kind of make it easier to sync up data with other sources or incorporate other information that kind of lets us draw broader conclusions or kind of expand on the scope and documentation. And nobody in the world likes writing documentation. Well, maybe there's a couple of weird people out there who do, but like most people don't like writing documentation. And it's critically important. The like, why was the study done? What were the precise procedures? What was the data intended to do? Maybe even what do we think you could do with it besides what we did with it? Would all be great kind of narrative documentation to have at the like top level with a data set. So I'm talking a lot about the archiving of data because I think the accessibility of it is one of the routes we can have to improving our impact. And the goal of archiving data is basically to support discovery and new uses of the data, which are all kind of secondary analysis because it's not the thing that the data was created for. But that begs the question of discovery by whom and usage by whom. So I've had grad students go looking for NASA data and find it and ultimately decide it's not for them, it is not usable, it is unintelligible, um, and put it aside in favor of far less interesting data um, because it simply wasn't made accessible. 
So I think the default way of archiving data, which is like put as little into it as you can possibly do and get away with, um, means you're limiting the scope of the reach of your project. And so if you really do want to reach a broader audience with it, you have to kind of be deliberate about it. I would claim that you can achieve some broader impacts and broaden participation through data, maybe not in the like bringing in underrepresented communities sort of way, but in expanding the scope of who can engage sort of way. Um, number one, teachers and students. Um, I teach a course where I'm always looking for data to six students on and have them really dig into. Um, and those can be teachers and students at every level of the education system and people who are just out there to learn things on their own, those quote unquote casual enthusiasts whom I would also call very hardcore if they're actually digging into data sources. And then there's scientists in other fields, and this is easy to discount, but um, people who work in machine learning um, need training data sets. Um, people who are working on models need data sets that they can work with. Um, people who are um, doing algorithmic work often need data sets to work with that are adequately large and complex um, to make it worth running kind of their tools against. So it, it can be really hard to predict who is gonna actually find value in it. Um, but from some work, um, Again, with the eBird team, despite the lack of attribution, this was something I was involved in as well, where we were looking at who downloaded data to use it from the eBird data sources. And we found that, yes, academics and students were a big chunk of that pie. And that went all the way from PIs um, in academia to middle school students who had to do a GIS project. Um, and then there was a very small sliver of commercial interests, which you know, that's great if you can um, appeal to that crowd, it's probably not gonna show up for everybody. Um, the NGOs and governmental might be in part a result of the fact that it's conservation oriented data. So there's a number of other organizations that could benefit from it. But again, depending on what you're working on, there might be that broad, broader audience that you're just not really aware of because you haven't really made it available to them. And then just the general interest. This was landowners who wanted to figure out when to trim their trees and all kinds of things. And so they were looking to this data set to explore for their own purposes, which is kind of the coolest thing I can think of. It's like, I have a question and I'm going to satisfy it because the data is right here for me. So the problem is archiving data and doing all the work to like make it usable for these purposes and to get people involved is not necessarily what we're trained for. It is not something that sounds or looks easy. Um, it is usually, usually kind of a one-time project, um, depending on how you do it. But what accessible data really requires is not rocket science. I can, I can definitely like say that for sure. So field specific um, standards and metadata, like this is pretty standard, right? And we should all be doing this. It's easy not to um, if we're in a hurry and time constrained and all of that. There's also emerging citizen science standards um, that help link data across different sources. Um, better documentation is almost always needed. Um, it is very rare to find properly documented data. And I know, cause I've had students go looking. Um, data dictionaries in particular are most useful for sort of lay usage, um, things in plain language that tell you what all the things mean and why they're kind of recorded the way they are, what measurement units, all the basics, right? That is probably the number one thing for most users. Um, and that's actually not so hard to develop as you go if you're being thoughtful about it process-wise. Another thing that you might not might not occur to you in immediately is that you might need multiple versions of your data products to really have the full impact. So we always want the sort of raw de-identified data where um, you've got everything and you can play with it to your heart's content so long as we're not like revealing people's home addresses, for example. But then you might want some value added or summarized data products. So anybody who's ever looked at a Zooniverse data dump from their reports, like if you can do summarization on that, it would make it a lot easier for the average person to dig in through that and use that. Um, sometimes there are covariates that you can add in that provide extra value for your own analyses. They would probably provide value for other people too. Those are generally going to be a separate deposit, but related. And it's once you've done it for one, it's very little additional effort to do it for another. With all of this, which sounds like kind of a lot, librarians are your go-to resource. They are trained in this. They are thrilled to help people make information available. And I can't like recommend librarians enough for this kind of thing. So I've trained some of them who are in the DC area. <laughs> 
I'd also recommend consulting participants. Um, so this is kind of a potential secret weapon for making your data usable. First of all, you could ask them what the potential use cases are for that data. What would they want to do with it if they got their hands on it? Um, what do they imagine other people who are interested in the material would do with it? Um, and you can then use that information to think about how the data can be curated and described to support those uses. They could also be pre-deposit reviewers. So once you have that documentation together, you're about to ship it to whoever's gonna stick it wherever it's gonna go for posterity, um, have them look it over. Does it make sense? Um, are they able to understand the terminology? Um, are there things that they feel are missing or stuff that is just kind of over their heads? Um, that's a really good kind of sanity check on whether what you've got is going to really a kind of achieve that potential of broadening participation and access. So related to kind of improving what you can do with your project, um, I've never heard a citizen science project say that they don't need evaluation. However, there's lots of valid reasons that it doesn't get done. We don't have budget because often you need to hire a consultant because we weren't trained in it. We don't really know what we're doing with it. We're so busy running things that who has the time to stop and like take stock um, because you gotta keep things running. Um, so these are real challenges and I'm not gonna pretend it's not, um, but just because it's not required, doesn't mean you don't need it, right? And um, if we only did what we were required to do, the world would be a sad place, right? Um, and I would say because it's not mandated right now doesn't mean it'll stay that way. Um, so I would expect that in the future, evaluation requirements are likely to be um, levied because it helps justify the investment. Um, and for the time being, that might be just scientific outputs, but in the future, that might also expand to um, consider other kinds of outputs and um, successes for the projects. Related to the kind of planning ahead notion, part of what I've seen in the current um, progress, uh, excuse me, I've been already lecturing for an hour and a half, um, <laughs> the current project I'm working on on embedded assessment is that sometimes the data that we need the most is the stuff that's easiest to overlook and it takes time to accrue it. This is often information about volunteers, volunteer management, training, things like this so that might not be default recorded in technical systems or that might not be something that you're collecting and routinely keeping records of. Um, so depending on exactly what the focus of an evaluation is, it can actually be a huge advantage to start keeping some of those records well in advance. Um, so one of the projects that we worked with uh, is a Zooniverse project that you might've heard of, Gravity Spy. And they had some really interesting analyses that they wanted to do at the forefront of the project. And so after we had an initial conversation with them, they went and set up analytics so that they could record the stuff that they would need to be able to run the analyses they wanted to do. And then they had to wait six months, right? And so in terms of kind of keeping your process moving. And if you've got looming deadlines, like that's not the greatest setup, right? It would be so much nicer if you had some sense that that might be coming and you had some data collecting in advance. The good news is sometimes the data that you would need to collect in advance to really get full value um, isn't that hard to keep records of. It just really is going to depend on the particular project and its needs. So what can you get out of evaluation? There's like a ton of things you can get out of evaluation, um, but I'm just gonna go like things that are top of my brain because I've seen them really clearly and I feel like they're really relevant to the data conversation. You can verify how closely participants are following instructions depending on what you're recording and how you're looking at it. Um, generally, the answer to that is gonna be not particularly well. Um, so what it might do is show you where you need to prompt people to take a moment longer to reconsider what they're doing, to review the tutorial and what have you. Um, you can also, as mentioned earlier, get evidence of participant skills or performance at tasks, which has multiple uses. You can use it from that analytical standpoint. You can also use it to decide whether you need to improve your training or tutorial. You can use it to um, identify uh, people that you want to cultivate as uh, like the super users because they're really amazing contributors and clearly get it, right? So there's a number of different applications that this kind of information could have. And the project leaders that we've worked with on this had no shortage of ideas of what they could do in terms of program management and program improvement. 
Um, and of course, it identifies some areas for improvement or growth. Where you find issues and um, problems popping up, you can actually address them um, as opposed to having a suspicion, which we all do, um, but not necessarily having looked close enough to know what's really going on. Um, a beta or a pilot is really the bare minimum to do any justice to it. Even once you get it off the ground, things look viable, they're going reasonably well, like then it's time to do some evaluation and figure out what could be better or what is maybe not going as well as you think it is. Right? And so I think for a lot of projects, there's plenty of room for kind of iterative evaluation and improvement. And it takes quite a while for a lot of projects to kind of max out on that value. Um, but it really depends on what you can invest in that and you know how you've got things structured and what you want to accomplish. One of the other things that I think is that it signals the value of participants' work. Um, so anytime you can say, hey, we did this evaluation and here's what we found, or we're asking you to participate in this evaluation effort, that tells people that their work is valued and that we care about their inputs and that they're human beings in our eyes, not just you know data robots, right? And that's important for recruitment and retention. Um, and it's easy to understate how important that could be. As a caveat, with all evaluation stuff, most of it should be treated as human subjects research, even if a review board says it's not, even if you're not comfortable like saying that it's human subjects research, you often don't know for sure until you're doing it, whether it really should have counted as human subjects research. And you're never gonna go wrong if you're on the conservative side of that. The other issue with um, treating things as human subjects research is then you're gonna default to the most privacy protecting kind of respectful way of interacting with the participants. And you also don't know what you're gonna get out of it. So you might just get program improvement, great. That's actually definitely not human subjects research, but you might wanna publish something about that. That's human subjects research, right? So if you would ever possibly use anything from an evaluation process in a publication, then it's best to get it reviewed and kind of think through how to do it in a respectful way that's not gonna violate people's expectations. Because the last thing you want is to be on bad ethical grounds with anybody. And with that, I'm curious to hear your questions and concerns and wild ideas, either in this conversation or um, after the fact on social media or by email. So thank you for being an audience just as quiet as my students. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful, Andrea. That was great. And yes, audience, if you have questions, anything, um, put it in the chat. You can go technical, you can go conceptual, anything and all questions are eagerly accepted. And while we're waiting for people's to, um, yeah, we can stop sharing this, this screen um, so we can have big faces. While people are pulling their questions together, I have one. Um, so I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I haven't heard that idea of a narrative documentation of a data set as much as I ought to have. And I've been very focused on data management plans. And I think I was under the impression that a data management plan would do um, the service of a narrative. And maybe not. Can you talk about those two very important descriptive pieces about data sets and how, what goes in one, what goes in the other and are so there- So data management yeah. plans are usually um, kind of the upfront planning. You have to kind of get some sign off on it. You often have to do it for the purpose of getting the funding. If you are doing human subjects research, you should really make sure it lines up with your IRB application. It's one of those checks and balances stuff that seems to never happen. Um, so that's more on the forefront, but it's not usually what you expose people to after you've collected it. Um, so what I was mentioning with like a narrative just kind of uh, data documentation is when I talk about metadata with my students, I talk about descriptive and structural. This is sort of in that descriptive space, but I think if you've got a general public audience, you kind of need to take it even further in that descriptive direction and make it easier to understand. And I don't think we have really good examples or practices around that. Um, so that's, I, I think, an area where we could really contribute um, that the scientific community doesn't really prioritize. That's a, like, yeah, like, that was that, gonna be Anna? my follow-up. Yes, and that was my follow-up question. Are there, are there emerging standards for what belongs in one of those narrative descriptions of, or narrative documentation? And not yet, sounds like. Yeah, I think there's room, room to grow, right? Okay. 
All right, so all right, we've got Victoria's hand up and a bunch of questions. <laughs> we do, and Victoria, we're trying to do questions in the chat. So if you can stick your question in there and I'm gonna read the first one that came through. Um, so we have one, what's the best way to collect demographic data? This is a real question for a lot of people. Most yeah. citizen science apps that we use don't ask for it, yet it can be so valuable to researchers and our participants are often turned off by being asked about it. So any ideas or suggestions about how to do that gently? So I don't know that, so this is another area where I feel like we have some room to grow because everybody's been so afraid of putting people off that they just won't ask. And sometimes that's a legitimate choice because like, honestly, do we really need to know their gender? Probably not. Um, however, if we do need to like verify that we're serving a certain audience or something like that, then there's a reason to ask for it, right? Um, yeah, the apps don't ask for this because again, keeping that barrier low, I think, the hard part is, do you need it to be tied to the data that they contribute? If you do, that's a much harder question. And that actually does kind of involve some technical finagling. If you don't need the data tied to the identity and the demographics, and you can just get some demographics that kind of give you a picture of what's going on in your project, first, be aware it's going to be biased response. But second, like, I don't think you can beat a survey if you can get contact information or have a way to kind of put a link in front of people who are participating, that's probably going to be your best bet. Now, all of that is kind of subject to how willing are people to share information. And I think some of that has to do with how well we explain why we need it and what we're going to do with it and how we're going to safeguard it in non-technical language. And anytime you have to do the whole IRB consent form, that is that is not non-technical language, no matter how hard you try. And it is the most off-putting part of every interview I've ever done is the informed consent piece, right? So it, it's a kind of a hard thing to balance. Some people are gonna be put off and spooked, but I think if you explain what it does for the benefit of the project well enough, people will be willing to engage. Excellent point. This came up in a conversation yesterday in the Citizen Science Association around evaluation. And we were talking about logic models as a resource to help project designers figure out what they're what they're doing and why they're doing it and where those questions are going to be. So look for that in our that will be part of our data primer. So we have another question. Um, do you have thoughts about the best way to manage this, given the fact that in lots of projects, people have different roles? So people who are using the data or managing the data aren't necessarily the people who are doing the training or most of the volunteer management and communication. That sounds like a, an issue of um, kind of connecting the dots internally. If the team is small, that's usually not hard, but if the team is larger, that can be pretty complicated. And it kind of just requires that extra deliberate effort on the part of the people who are either requesting it from the folks who have access to it or the people who have access, making sure that those who need it are getting it. But I think that starts with knowing who wants which information and who has that information. And then you can kind of resolve it from there. That would be my best guess, uh, the best way to do it. If you're really doing proper fancy data management, like universities want to do, um, but don't actually follow through on. Uh, you have uh, permission control on who can access which parts of the data, um, which can make it more complicated on occasion. Um, but most of the time, the data that we're talking about, is not going to be so sensitive that there should be access controls that kind of constrain practical uses. Sounds like team meetings and good communication are in order, a good place to start. So here is a question, and we don't know who it's coming from, but maybe Rihanna, you can fill this in. Do you have recommendations on how or where to deposit data? And Ooh. certainly in the NASA world, that's something that we're working on actively. Um, but what about in the non-NASA world? Are there places mm. where? That's a great question. And yeah. it is something that when I was working with Data One, we pointed out as an issue over and over and over. Um, and we weren't sure what the best solution was going to be. So depending on your discipline and where you're publishing, there might be 
a perfect venue for it. Like Dryad for biological sciences is a good mm -hmm. one. Um, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. But some data aren't going to fit within those disciplinary um, repositories. Or if you don't have the journal publication to go with it, they won't take the data. Um, and so I feel like there's a lot of citizen science data that are functionally orphan data sets in as much as they don't fit the criteria for most of the data repositories. And that is a real challenge. Um, the first stop for me would be a librarian to, to like ask, do you know of anything? I've checked these places. Um, but part of the, the, the tension around this that we discussed a lot with our data one working group was that we were concerned that if there was a citizen science specific repository, that it would be second class citizen data repository. And we did not want things to be said like seen that way. So we didn't really push for that as a thing that needed to happen. However, I feel like the tide has changed a little in 10 years and we might actually um, have more success with that kind of thing now. Um, for anybody who's affiliated with academic institutions, something in your university or your university system or depending on what kind of institution, you, there may be an institutional repository. Some of the institutional repositories can handle data sets as well. I know my institution has a repository but does not handle data. However, at the system level, UN Lincoln does do data deposits. And so I could go knocking on their door and ask if they would take the data if I had produced something that I wanted to archive that didn't fit anywhere else. So it's a little bit of sleuthing. Sometimes there's some clear options, but sometimes it there, it's really hard to figure out what the right place might be. And I think there's a few places like Figshare and GitHub and places where you can kind of park that data, but they're not ideal because they're not really data repositories. Right. And I've, I'm with you on librarians being superheroes of the planet and a number of people in the chat have, have said as much as well. Um, and all librarians aren't created equal or don't have the same specialty? Is there a particular kind of librarian you should, who you should bring your data questions to that's a common name for them? So data librarians, basically. Data librarians, all right, um, there you go. Uh, if you just go to the reference desk and ask who handles this kind of thing, they should be able to point you in the right direction. Or if they don't know, they might be able to do some searching alongside and, and help you figure okay. it out. Okay, sounds great. And by the way, most of these questions are beginning with thank you, Andrea. So <laughs> there's, you've got a lot of fans in the audience and a lot of people really appreciated what you've said so far. Um, so here's another <laughs> few questions that you may or may not know the answers to. Um, but what are some of the best practices you've seen for funding, funding and valuing data life cycle care and managing, management within or beside a project? So the Best way I've seen this managed is funding a technical team, essentially, that does all forms of support for a project mm -hmm. um, and making it part of those responsibilities. And then it becomes split across, across different um, funding sources. So mm -hmm. it's not a big line item in any one. However, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we don't put this in our budgets. Um, and even if it's a small amount or something like that, uh, if you can put in 10% funding for an admin person or, or even less maybe because it might be a one-off activity and have somebody who's adequately detail-oriented help facilitate these processes, um, we could start to actually set the expectation that a data management plan actually costs something. And yeah. I don't know about all funders, but NSF knows this. People just don't prioritize it in their applications, right? And when you have to cut your budget over and over, that would likely be one of the things that get, gets cut. But I think staff support is probably the best way to handle it. And it's probably the sort of thing that would merit like fractional staff pay or get spread across multiple funders. That's such a good point. And it's such a scary point for anyone who's in the position of writing grant proposals. Um, to actually act on. But when we do submit grant proposals, we are educating our funders and making a case for the things that really matter that they may not um, recognize We're is important. And I'm, viewers. Absolutely. And that goes across the board from little foundations all the way to federal agencies. So I'm not, that's not a pointed comment at anyone, but it, it's just a, it's an observation. Um, okay. Oh, Kristen Weaver is asking if you have any examples of projects that have done a great job with that descriptive narrative. 
Um, so it ends up being a go-to for me way too often, but looking at the documentation for the eBird data is, it's amazing. Um, it is not short, um, but it's not overly technical. And it does things like um, specify, if you can't find this trend, your model is wrong, because we know empirically that this trend happened. Um, so things like the range expansions for uh, particular kinds of dubs, right? If the model doesn't pick it up, the model's wrong. Um, and so they've actually documented some things that you can use to even test your work against that data, which is the above and beyond level. Um, but I think they describe things in terms that aren't overly complex. They aren't necessarily terms of art. They're fairly understandable to somebody who's who's willing to pick up data and play with it. Most of those folks are going to be somewhat more educated and experienced with data than the average population. Great, it's good to have an example though, thank you. So um, Tamlin Pavelski of the LOCKS program, Lake Observations by Citizen, or um, I'm gonna get this wrong, Citizen Scientists and Satellites. He's asking, uh, his project has gone through an IRB approval process and collected a fairly extensive survey on citizen scientists' motivations and democratics. However, none of us are social scientists and we're a bit skittish about publishing the results for fear of getting things wrong. Do you have any advice on pitfalls or best practices for publishing this kind of work? Find a social scientist to work with. <laughs> like that is hands down the way to go here. Um, if it's something where you're just not sure about the interpretation and um, being able to represent it properly, that's something where it's, it's very hard to fill that gap confidently. Um, and if you can find somebody that is willing to work with you on data that's already been collected, and it's going to take a fair bit of like filling them in on the blanks, but they can actually make sure that you are presenting things in the way that means the social science reviewers aren't going to go for the, the throat, basically. Um, Great. I don't know a better you, way to do it than that. <laughs> and do you have suggestions for where someone who, who is a scientist in another field might find a social scientist? to work with if they're not familiar with that literature and those that community? Um, I would, my, so the first thing I would probably do if I was gonna look for somebody to work with on this is I would go over to citizen science theory and practice and look who's, at who has published on what and cherry pick some authors based on the material they've published in that particular venue. So I would know that they kind of understand the space and understand the conceptual space and then send uh, like rank who I want to approach and then send very polite intros and hope to God I get a good response. That would be my first step. Um, depends on really what kind of um, opportunities that you have to connect to others. And this is one of the things I would love to see better ways for us to facilitate through the CSA um, because there's people like me who love to play with data, but you know, we have to like establish a relationship and work on some things in order to like move something forward and motivation. Some of you have heard my rant on this is not my cup of tea in terms of like theoretical focus. Um, however, there's a lot of people who have spent a lot of time thinking about this and would be excellent to work with on it. Great answer and great call out for citizen science theory and practice. If that's a new journal to you, maybe somebody can drop a link. Um, oh, Rihanna's already beat me to it. There's a link in the chat, bookmark that. It's free open access and there's great resources for thinking about citizen science. And there's a pretty good search engine to find some articles that might be of interest to you. So now Mark has a fun question for you. Tell us a data horror story. Oh gosh. So uh, this isn't citizen science data specifically, um, but it is related to NASA. Um, so there's kind of like two pieces to it. And this is kind of what got me interested in data management, which is like the driest of all topics if you're kind of looking at it from the outside. Um, it was this article about this heroic investment by NOAA, NASA, and NSF to save data that were on redwood tape systems, of which only three had ever been manufactured because they were so big and so expensive. Um, because magnetic tape is actually still the most durable memory media. And the problem was the machines broke down and they needed to migrate the data off of there. And they ended up Frankensteining the systems to read the data off. And they were able to save basically the foundational data for all climate research. That was what was at stake there. Of course, there's also the stories about um, Apollo 
uh, mission videos being found in Florida academic building basements, which is probably the worst place to keep those kinds of, yeah, yeah. And apparently they had recorded over some of the Apollo mission data because, you know, it, tapes are expensive back in the day, right? Um, and those are multi-data track tapes at the time. So it was just, it kind of blows your mind about what data might actually be laying around and potentially available to recover. Um, but in similar veins, like some organizations get um, people's like extensive natural history observations turned over to them and don't really have a way to actually turn that data into something usable, which is a, a shame, right? So I, I swear I had nightmares over that, like, oh my God, this critical, important data for so much research almost like went the way of the dodo because of rarefied systems. Wild. <laughs> Mark, anything, to, any follow-ups? Is that a good enough story for you? I'm just nervous. <laughs> You're still muted. There you are. Oh, yay. Hi, Andrea. Thanks so much for, for yeah. joining us today. It's great to see you. Yeah, same. Uh, Yay, thank you for the story. Um, I was actually hope that, I mean, that was certainly horrible. <laughs> no <Right>? doubt. <laughs> um, I was hoping for one that was like um, more citizen science specific, like this citizen science project that you've all heard of made this simple data mistake and all heck broke loose. I mean, I, I, I can't name names on that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not the kind of thing people want to own up to yeah. either. Um, but so one of the things that's come up in this evaluation project that I've been working on recently is that um, the data are there, but they're in hard copy and there's 20 years mm -hmm. of it. And therefore it would take months of work to actually put it into a digital format where we could potentially use it for the purpose that it could be leveraged for. And it's a, it's a shame of a missed opportunity um, because it's the kind of thing which nobody would have predicted that that data would be useful um, down the road. Um, but at this point, like with thousands and thousands of records, like this is not a small project to be able to retrieve that and make use of it. Um, so it would have to be a much higher priority to the organization to kind of go through that kind of work. And it wasn't like a mishap. It was just a, we didn't predict that this would be something that we might ever want um, down the road. So Lynn and I both think that that sounds like a Zooniverse transcription <laughs> project in the making. Um. <laughs> it could be if they if they were up for it and if it felt like a high enough priority for them, um, that actually could be pretty interesting. I think there's a, a challenge in that it is also kind of identifiable information because oh. it's going to have volunteers' names on it. Right. Um, and so until we come up with a better way of managing that piece of it, um, I think it the overhead might not be in keeping with the payoff for this particular example, but I suspect that there are others where it is. So like there's right. been a whole project out of um, Patuxent um, to digitize bird phonology records. And uh, the kind of story with that was like, they were on note cards and um, Chan Robbins physically put his body between the records and people who were going to dispose of them and said, no, this is valuable data. And it has gone on to be digitized slowly over time to create a pretty irreplaceable data set. Well, there are a lot of data horror stories, I guess. Um, but changing the subject a little <laughs> bit, <laughs> Holly Cole is interested in the embedded assessment work that you mentioned. Can you share an example of the kind of information that you're getting from embedded assessments? So we are, it's, it's a fairly large project with several collaborators, um, Kat Starlinski, Karen Peterman, um, Rachel Becker-Klein, Tina Phillips, and I feel like I'm forgetting somebody, which is terrible. Um, and um, we have two different strategies. One is uh, a group of projects co-designed an embedded assessment that could be done by their participants that measured kind of the same thing. Um, and so they were all kind of observation focused. So I think it was um, noticing relevant features was part of it. Um, the piece that I've been more involved with was the one that tried to essentially replicate the approach from that Kelling et al. 2015 paper and use the data that's already in hand to understand how much um, 
participants are learning, what skill development they, they might be demonstrating. And so we've worked with five um, projects with that. And the kinds of things, like I can't go into too much because there's a bunch of manuscripts under development, but the kinds of things that they wish they had almost always come down to volunteer management information and the kinds of things like who did what training, when, um, what kind of follow-up did they did we do with them, um, uh, which kind of instrument were they using to navigate to a location, um, things that just weren't recorded because nobody realized it might be valuable down the road. Um, and that's, it's a real challenge to make that up for the two of the projects. Um, they decided partway through that they weren't gonna be able to evaluate what they wanted to, to begin with. And one of them retooled their, um, their forms for volunteers so that they could start collecting the right data to be able to do this in the future and keep an eye on it and make sure that they're getting what they need. The other one said that the evaluation actually told them what they needed to know about the project and it justified basically closing it and starting something different. Um, and that is actually invaluable because it means they're spending their time and effort far more effectively. Um, so yeah. it was it was largely like what they saw was that the people who were involved were people who had a shared concern and they wanted to interact around that concern more than they really wanted to do the monitoring. And so they ended up kind of shuttering that project, which there might have been other reasons involved too, but this this didn't this was like a verification essentially, um, and redirecting their attention to something else. Project life cycle and data life cycle all together. Mm -hmm. um, excellent, thank you. Uh, we have another question that's kind of an open-ended one. Can you address intellectual property and security issues around data? So this is a really interesting one. Um, as I love to tell my students, um, data are statements of fact and therefore not copyrightable in the US. However, the arrangement of data, the way you structure it and what you do with it, that is copyrightable. And so there is IP on data sets as a whole, but not necessarily on individual pieces of data. Um, basically, the more you protect it, the less value it delivers. Um, that is kind of hands down what the open science community has been finding over and over for years now. Um, there are legitimate reasons to want to do protection. So if there's commercial value and you could potentially have a revenue stream that supports your activities, like that's actually something to consider capitalizing on. And that is definitely done in certain projects. Um, there are some where they need to do environmental assessments so people buy access to the data for those purposes. However, for members, for people who contribute, access is free. So the gatekeeping on access to data is kind of variable by situation. Generally speaking, I'm going to militantly encourage minimal gatekeeping. However, like it's there's different situations that merit different approaches. So that's kind of the intellectual property piece. The information security piece is, I mean, there's the, the same if you, issues with security as any other web-based anything. Um, the I think best thing to do is not be a target if you can avoid it, um, which means not drawing in trolls and people who think that hacking your site would be great fun. Um, but also like, there's not much motivation if they don't get something out of it. So it would have to be sensitive information or something over which there is a real public debate for people to want to target some of this data. So without more context about like what kinds of information security issues are of concern, it's, it's kind of hard to say. The biggest risk for information security is always internal um, and it's always behavior, not so much the systems. So we are our worst enemies in terms of securing information. So if it needs to be kept under wraps, um, then limiting access tends to be the most appropriate approach. And there's, tons of resources on, on managing information security specifically, but it's very situational. Great, good start. Uh, so we have another, um, thank you so much. This was a really useful talk comment. And the question from Laura Petacolis is, do you have any knowledge or perspective on single event citizen science projects? She leads a crowdsourcing effort to collect eclipsed images of total solar eclipses. And she did this in 2017. They learned a lot from gathering 50,000 images, but could benefit from any other single event projects. Maybe, yeah. So that sounds like, or, hmm. 
it sounds like a really good opportunity for connection, like through CSA, actually, because um, like I've seen the results from Laura's work and it's fantastic. They've learned so much. It's such a cool project, right? But there are actually plenty of very time limited or discrete event kinds of projects out there. And I don't know that they're particularly well networked because the short time focus on it, uh, I think is a doesn't encourage us to engage on an ongoing basis in the professional community, right? Um, and so we get our stuff done and we move on to the other projects. Um, but I think if there's any chance of repeating it, then reaching out and connecting with some of the folks who do some of this periodic kind of data collection um, is a great way to do it. We've seen projects that normally do ad hoc whenever you want participation, but they do a campaign to get participation on certain dates and they see a huge spike because um, open-ended is too open for some people and having a, like, we really need it this weekend is enough impetus to make it happen. Um, so I, I believe it was the Great Sunflower Project tried that and it really saw some interesting results out of it in terms of participation levels. But event-based stuff, you have to be able to predict it in order to do the data collection around it. So some of that is fairly easy to do and particularly like with the eclipses, you can do it well in advance. However, like for some of the things that might be really, really interesting, we're lucky if we get real time anything like Aurora. Um, and so post hoc might be the best we can do. And so kind of collection materials post hoc, it, then it's a question of um, exposure and being able to get the word out to people so that you can actually collect that information, I think. So, so my best guess for you, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, and Lynn, I missed this when we were having an exchange earlier about um, consent information and making that understandable and friendly. So Lynn Chambers mentioned that she attended an event at the Wilson Center pre-COVID, so it's a little while ago and details are fuzzy, but they had some good presenters on making consent information understandable and friendly. Does that ring a bell with you? Can you direct us in the in that to who that might have been? So I might have been at the same event because I also <laughs> remember a Wilson Center event where this was a a, a topic of discussion and it was around um, ethical, legal and social implications of citizen science in health. And yeah. so we really need consent to be solid in those cases. What mm -hmm. I'm thinking of specifically is Sage Bio Networks um, had done some work with mobile apps for, um, for uh, Parkinson's patients that used the uh, mobile devices uh, sensors to record um, how well they were performing on tasks over time and to use that to analyze for signs of incipient Parkinson's. And they had a really thoughtfully developed ongoing consent process um, that was built into the app and made sure that people were comfortable continuing to give data over time. Um, so this is something that I wrote a paper with Ann Bowser about that I believe was in human computation circa 2015, um, because like the kind of issues with the way that we do consent in citizen science, they just, there's some misalignments with the institutional approach versus the kind of people powered approach. The other places that I would look as points of reference tend to be work that's done with patient communities specifically, where it's in partnership and whether where you have patient um, leadership or um, leadership by people who are affected by whatever it is. Um, I think this is, I see this do, done really, really well, um, actually by the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, um, because they do plain language summaries of a lot of the stuff that they do. And I've never seen anything quite like it in terms of the simplicity of the description for people who have intellectual disabilities. And so I think we could kind of take a cue from that and, and the way that plain language summaries can be written to do better with some of this consent language. What a great, um, both it's great to have, know and a good example of somebody doing that really well. And what a great example of the value of getting outside of your field in the citizen science world, that there may be examples and models uh, to follow from way outside of whatever scientific field you're operating in. So I'm going to interrupt us for just a minute because I want to make a couple um, announcements about the next event in this series. But we are coming back um, with our, I just have to find my slides. Actually, we'll take another question and then I'll find my slides while you're answering this very interesting question um, from Xing Feng that I want to listen to the answer to. So. Yeah, we'll try. Um, you mentioned the idea about having different versions of a data set 
the raw data set and then a value added data set without focusing on who's responsible for creating that value added data from the raw data. Who should be responsible for quality checking the value added data? And what if a project doesn't have the resources to support quality checking? Do you have any good ideas for how to do that on a budget? So that is a really interesting question. Um, so who's responsible for doing the value add? In the examples I've seen before, it was done by the team working with the data, whoever was doing the analysis, it was part of what they were doing. And at least one case, it was part of the contract that they, the funding that they had was that they were going to add all these covariates and it was a lot. And it was a lot of data crunching to make it happen. So it was a pretty substantial kind of effort investments, but there was a good argument for the payoff. Um, so even if it's just somebody has incorporated weather data into a data set so that they can do a particular analysis that could actually be saved and shared. Doing the quality check on that, however, that's a great question. I'm not sure how they managed that specifically. The kind of cheap and easy way to do that, I guess, would be sort of internal team review um, on, say, a 1% random sampling or something like this. Um, that would be kind of, you know, relatively low level and achievable. The on a budget, but you really want to check everything approach, get some citizen scientists involved. They'd probably be your best bet, honestly. That, I'd, I don't know where else you would be able to get people who would be that invested in it, who'd be willing to do that detail work, um, but probably the project volunteers might be interested. I love it. Citizen scientists to the rescue. Okay, now I am going to interrupt us for just a few minutes. We're going to come back and do more Q&A. And Andrea, you're, the scope of your knowledge is very impressive. So we have a bunch more questions um, coming up. But first, let me remind you all. There, I hope you can see my screen. Our next event in the NASA Citizen Science Leader Series will be on October 14th. And we're going to be digging into this white paper, NASA ESDS Citizen Science Data Working Group White Paper. And this is from the Earth Science Division. It was written by PIs of Project who got together and compiled this white paper really out of their own need for um, direction and clarity and resources to help them solve data challenges. It remains a really valuable resource, an internal NASA resource that we're going to lean on pretty heavily as we move forward with creating that outline of that NASA citizen science data primer for all the divisions. So to do this, we're gonna break into four groups in two weeks. And each of you just needs to pick one section to dig into and read. Each section is only about 12 pages. If you get out ahead of it, um, maybe you wanna read more. There's certainly a lot of value in this. All the details about that October 14 event are at our series website, nasasitsi.gmri.org. So find out more information there. Um, we also have a special bonus event happening on October 14th. NASA is, NASA's Open Source Science Initiative, which is underway right now, is holding a workshop on open source science for data processing and archives. It happens from noon to three, just before, it's East Coast time, on the 14th, just before our event starts at 3.30. If you're interested in this, again, you can find a link. Uh, look for the blue banner on the website, on our website at nasasitside.gmri.org. Follow the link for more information and to register for that event. And start reading now and then you won't be stuck um, needing to do a bunch of cramming right before it begins. So those are my announcements and we're gonna go back to um, our questions. Okay. Are we out of questions? Is it possible? I see lots of questions. There are a lot. Okay. <laughs> I was happy that a, you were deciding we a, which ones. We have a system in the background. They're getting pulled out of the Q&A or the chat and getting put into a document. So Rihanna, Jennifer, where are we? Are there any questions that we've missed? Or new ones coming? Okay, here's one from Liz. Can you define open innovation and talk more about that? I feel like question. this is a trap. <laughs> so my, my 
partner it's from a friend team. and fan partner. of yours <laughs> yeah so i know liz wouldn't do that on purpose but my partner works on innovation and it's like an in joke in our household that innovation is always misused um i think what people usually mean when they're talking about open innovation is things like um some of the challenges and, and things like this, where you essentially say, here's an issue we need to solve. We don't care who can solve it. Um, here's the relevant resources, help us figure it out. Or things like some of these, um, uh, what do they call them? Data thons or there's a, there's a hackathons, um, right? If you use the word hack, however, you really reduce women's partic participation, it turns out. So use some other term besides hacking. Um, but know. basically that, yeah, it's a really interesting like bias, I think, in, in how things are presented to people. Um, but I think those are events where you basically might be able to put a problem or a set of resources or something in front of a group of interested people and have them monkey with it for a while and see what they can come up with. And if, depending on how that was structured, if there was some ongoing participation opportunities with it, that might also kind of yield some of those unexpected directions. So, and you would think by now I would actually know the definition of innovation off the top of my head, but the person I would really refer you to is Joel Chan at University of Maryland. He studies open innovation and um, is a very friendly person. So he might be a really good resource on that. Okay, since we don't have another question, I'm gonna use my, um, I'm gonna ask another one. So I have been in some interesting conversations really about recently about data science and data literacy and how do we develop it both in youth but also in adults and there's some interesting um, ideas out there around well we've already screwed up math education and we do it in a way that turns off a lot of students but this data education is brand new so we have a chance to do it well and it's happening in some really exciting ways that are very connected uh, to the learner, whoever old they are, to the learner's world. So getting, drawing data sets from their world and then working with those, those data sets. So there's this really interesting opportunity of helping people develop data literacy with tool sets or data sets that are relevant to them. So citizen science just seems like a natural next step. If you've contributed to a citizen science project and you know something about the data set that's generated as a result of it, does that kind of give you some insight into how to work with that. Um, do you have any, what, what are your, what's your thinking around involving the citizen scientists who've contributed the data in working with the data? And do you have some good examples of projects that are doing that um, or thoughts on that broad topic? Can we use data literacy as a way to broaden participation in STEM? Can we use citizen science as a place to develop data literacy skills and ideas? So I think it's a really cool potential space and somebody ought to get a grant for this. Um, <laughs> because, um, some, there, there has been some work. So the example that I know of, like that comes immediately to mind is Alarm out of central Pennsylvania. They do community trainings where they train people to analyze the data that they're collecting and come to conclusions and interpret it themselves. This is not an easy thing. Um, I suspect it's far more involved than I'm aware of um, because just getting students who are paying you money to do this to actually follow through isn't that easy either. Um, I would say the participants in a project should actually be great potential participants in doing some of that data analytic work. Um, they might not have the skills to bring to it, but they probably know what's interesting and what to interpret out of results. So if I were going to try to engineer something like that, I would try to get a bunch of data science geeks together and a bunch of participants and put them in pairs um, to work on, like, let's figure out what's interesting with this data that's in front of us. Um, one person knows how to pull it out and do things with it. The other person knows what would be interesting and how to interpret it. And I think that could be really fascinating to see how that would work. What? Are there any more questions? Yes, people are talking about Julie Vestine. Yes, she's, she's current board member of the Citizen Science Association. Right, she's the leader of the Alarm Project. She might be a good person for us to tap. I suspect there are also folks in the social or the environmental justice community mm -hmm. who may have some experience along these lines as well. And I know that there is some kind of 
if it's not in the publications, it's kind of that anecdotal, everybody knows this kind of thing that people's lived experiences is, is something that they can use as a tool in reflecting on relevant data. Um, yeah. And so your own data gives you a, a very different way to approach understanding something. Um, yeah. And like this quantified self sort of thing, like you, you're like, oh, that's when I had to like run across O'Hare to make my connection. And that's when I was sitting on the plane for eight hours. Right. Um, and that's right. something somebody else can interpret quite like you can. Yeah, good example. And even data that's maybe one step removed from yourself. So Mark, I'm going to pull on on you and your experience with this detective and backyard worlds. Mark has done a lot of what you talked about in your remarks about looking using the participation data and projects to find people who are showing a certain aptitude or commitment to participating in that project and then bringing them kind of into an inner circle of the science team and getting them more and more involved in the project and in the data. And many of them do end up um, really digging into the data sets and contributing, but it's a pretty small number. And how do we grow the number of people who are participating on the edges of any citizen science project and pull them in deeper into the scientific process, which includes working with data? Have you seen any great examples of projects that do that well at scale? Or Mark, do you want to comment or do you have a question to ask on that angle? We're veering, a well, this isn't veering off from data, citizen science data. So my suspicion is it's always going to be a long tail. With yeah. That. There's always, it's always going to be a small number who have the skills and interest. However, there might be more people who are interested and just don't even know that it's an option. And so it might be um, highlighting the work that the people who have gotten involved are doing to other participants so that they see that there's room for this and we'll work with you. And we're really interested in fostering this. That seems like kind of the low hanging fruit approach um, to kind of encouraging further engagement along those lines. Yeah. It's a good point about the long, yes, Mark. You're still muted. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Um, one, one trick we found for getting more people involved uh, in these advanced user groups where we play with data is just having more um, events at different times of day. <laughs> you know, um, a big barrier. Uh, of course, is that people work during the work week and scientists work during the week week and our work week and our volunteers, many of them would rather participate with us on weekends. Mm -hmm. um, it almost made me want to like create some kind of NASA core of weekend science, weekend scientists who would kind of, you know, take turns just kind of connecting with people during the weekends. Other time zones also helps because we have you know so many participants from India, from England is such a big, you know, hotspot for citizen science. But really, that's just talking about like a factor of two or three. You know, we once we cover the Zion time zones and all the weekends, that might increase our participation. At least um, groups by a factor of a few. The question is still lingering out there: How do we get ten times as many people doing doing this? kind of data intensive work as citizen scientists. And I think, um, you know, part of the step is making our data archives more accessible. Andrea, as you mentioned, and as you're working on right now, Sarah, um, <laughs> we have a, we have I would say an approach that you might try is service learning courses. Um, I currently have students working with a local um, health and human services organization to do analysis of their data. That could be disk detective data just as easily. Um, so if you can build partnerships with any universities that have relevant programs or um, anything like that, there's potential to kind of bring an interested group in that way. It's not your primary participants, but it is getting some folks with their hands on the data and doing things with it that you might not expect, for better or worse. <laughs> there are a bunch of programs similar to that. I think similar to what you're describing. I mean, NASA has programs of, you know, aspiring data wizards, and um, I feel like 
these programs often aren't as well integrated with citizen science as they could be. Make a yeah. note. That sounds like a good idea. Uh, and as Andrea has reminded us a few times, there's an opportunity here as well to engage your citizen scientists in solving the problem, that some citizen scientists are really active in supporting each other in learning new things or helping each other find the resources to take the next step in a project. So engaging people who have shown some um, aptitude or have, have learned themselves, if they've learned just recently, they're probably kind of remembering um, accurately what it took to get them into an, a different level with the data. We still just have this problem where our data experts, they view themselves as serving the scientific community of experts only, you know, and um, even now with open science becoming such a big topic, I still have keep having conversations where I have to tell people, guess what, you're serving the whole public. Don't just make an email list for, um, you know, for professionals make it for the whole public don't just design your website for professionals who know what these acronyms are make it for the whole public uh it's um i think we just have some more work to do on changing the culture the skills are kind of rarefied too i mean it's really not something that most people come out of high school prepared to do and i think that's something we could we could develop partnerships with like community colleges and high schools to actually give them some opportunities to really have meaningful data exploration experiences, but there's lots of barriers in place and it has to be somebody's mission to make that happen. Yeah, well, it would be a good mission to take on. We are at uh, the top of the hour, so formally we're going to conclude this, but I think Andrea, did you say you could stick with us for a, a few minutes after the hour? Um, so we can we can finish up. We have at least two more questions to um, to ask. And I've lost my slides again, but I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. It's great to be back together again, and we can't wait to see you on October fourteenth, either at the Open Science or Open Source Science Initiative or um, at our event too. And do your reading that wonderful Earth Science Data white paper. Thanks for being here. And we do have a Mentimeter. Um, we do have a poll that we'd love to ask you. And this is more in the in the, in the theme of reflecting and evaluating projects. This uh, this um, Mentimeter survey that we're going to offer you is as much for your own reflection on what you've heard and what what might be meaningful, and what you might use in your own project, um, and giving us some information about what topics you've heard about today that you'd like to learn more about. Can we get that link in the chat? maybe since I've lost my slides again, it'll be there. Um, okay, so we have a question here from Allison Kaywood. Do you have thoughts about ways to approach project design that set you up better for data flow and data management later on? That is a million dollar question. If we could figure that out, we would be in so much better shape. <laughs> And I think like hard one experience is probably like your number one, like you have been through that ringer so many times, you probably have a much better way to set up projects now than you did when you started, right? Yeah. And I think one of the things that's often missing is really actually the good infrastructure to support it. So I've heard of people even using tools like Salesforce and various other like customer contact management systems to do volunteer management. There are formal vol volunteer management systems, but it's been kind of amazing to me how often that data was what we really needed to understand what was going on in a project and to understand people's engagement and participation. Um, so I guess the thought experiment or, or the line of thinking that I would try to, to use with that would be like, what could I imagine wanting to use down the line in a research project or to understand things in this project and seeing if you can kind of incorporate that up front. But like data flow is not an easy solved problem at all. And like it, all over the place, it's, it's a whole issue. Um, so I don't know that there are good answers for that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish uh, I had a magic wand on that. <laughs> well, you you both just illustrated exactly what we're up to with this NASA citizen science data primer. The whole idea is to tap into what people know in hindsight, because making the data horror stories 
they're not much fun to share, but you it's going to be hard to find someone who's lived through a data horror story who will ever make that same mistake again. We learn best from our mistakes. So we really want to draw from this community. What have you all learned to do yeah. and what have you learned not to do? Because um, that's what we're really trying to share to save each other from falling in some of the pitfalls that we've already fell fallen into just to mangle my grammar a little bit there but that's really what we're up to so we really hope that lots of you participate and contribute what you know we won't um, we'll credit you for all the things that you can tell other people to do and we'll hide your identity if you want um, if you want to share people <laughs> things people shouldn't do because of what you've learned um, but I that's exactly what we're up to in my experience the citizen science community is extremely gracious with sharing what they did wrong and how they fixed it um, because there's just it's I think it's the kind of people that are attracted to it um, they're they, they don't want somebody else to suffer the same mishaps that they've suffered and so I have had people say nope you can attribute my identity to that and align it with my project because I don't want anyone else to suffer through that particular issue um, which is I think really emblematic of what a great community this is but now I have this like idea for a survey I would love to do. For, like, what's the biggest <laughs> mistake you made in setting up your project that you would warn oh. people about, right? Because it would be pretty fascinating to see what kinds of errors like we make that might seem obvious in retrospect and might seem obvious to everyone else, but it wasn't at the time or else that wouldn't have happened. So, so true. Yeah, that would be an amazing survey to, to look at and, and to learn from. Um, and I just lost my train of thought entirely, but that's, yes, excellent point. Yeah, it's gone. Um, okay, we have one more question here. Um, Jaralal Janma wants to know, can you please address accessibility and usability issues of data formats? Citizen scientists and users of data employ different software tools and packages, R, Python, R Studio, MATLAB, Maple, Mathematica, Sage and the data output have different formats. How do we uniform uniformize the data collection and put the right formats out on our site or offer the right translation tools maybe as part of it? So the short answer is lowest common denominator um, and pretty CSV. much <laughs> CSV. Um, and that is, you can read that into any of those softwares um, as far as I know and um, and the nice thing is if you get a community around it and if you have opportunity to like to actually pull this off if people import it into another program and it kind of like if that's an effortful thing if they're willing to share their import file back that or their the like result of their import file so somebody puts it into a matlab format and if that's not just spitting back out a csv then if they can share that back then it reduces that step for somebody else um but like relational databases are really hard to squash down into flat files. And that is, I think, one of the hardest things um, that we have to deal with in doing this kind of work. I think some of the folks who work in data curation and like data stewardship would probably have pretty similar answers in terms of just like, yeah, it's going to make a more ver verbose data set to make it non-relational, but that's actually the right way to store it so that it's more usable for people using more different tools. Um, the nice thing is like, they're pretty compact and portable once you get them out. Um, and it's usually like, usually not hard to get that kind of file out of most systems, um, but it's well worth the effort to get it into that format if it does come out in some other kind of shape. And another great example of the generosity of the citizen science community. And that was what I was gonna say is, all of us are probably happy to share the things that we've learned because we know there are so many other things left to learn <laughs> that even if someone knew everything we knew they would still they'd still make other mistakes there's so much to learn and there's so much value in having these conversations and sharing andrea biggest challenge in this space is that it really does require so many competencies to do things to the standard that we want them done and we don't have all those competencies ourselves. We're not trained for it. And it's a big ask for anybody to manage all this stuff. So my way to approach it is always, is there somebody who knows this stuff better that I could tap into and reach out to 
who could at least help point me in the right direction and cut down the time that it takes me to get up to the like minimum level of competency. Or maybe they'll work with me on it if I'm really nice to them and offer co-authorship or whatever other like homemade cookies, right? Whatever it takes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we, yes, we believe in the power of barbecue in this community or in this series. We've talked about that before. Andrea, can't thank you enough for sharing all that you know in this wonderful conversation. And thank you everyone in the audience who's asked such good questions. We've covered a ton of ground here. It's been wonderful. And I'm sure there's more people. If you have questions, further questions, write them down and bring them back on October 14. Um, there'll be a chance to ask questions and get answers from other people in our community. This has been really, really delightful. Um, I think there aren't too many of us left on this um, call. So if people want to come, we can, Brianna, give people the power to come on audio if they want to. And Jennifer, it looks like you're ready to say something. So I'll give you the first word. Well, I was just going to chime in on that power of connection and community and uh, finding others with, with uh, complementary competencies and doing more together as a team. I think, Sarah, that's one of the things with this with this data primer, because just even even thinking just about the data world and the data management side of things, uh, people are expert in different aspects of that. And that's where I think this community and the project that we're moving towards in this community is going to be so much more powerful for those who come after um, because of the, the time that we invest in that together. Absolutely. And even just tapping into the different information and knowledge and experience of the different divisions, I think will will create a product that's going to be useful for everyone at NASA and hopefully others. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and to that end, thanks for the shout out, Andrea, to the, the CSA community too, because there, there's that, oh, yeah. that competency to that whole additional level. So please, if folks are interested, definitely come take advantage of that uh, connection into the CSA space to bring your own knowledge into that circle. Yeah, and I, I hope a number of people who are participating in the NASA Sitside Leader Series do join in the CSA Connect events and then bring back what you what you learn um, to our conversation because I'm sure that there's a lot to learn and cross fertilization is never a bad thing in this world. Oh, that was great. Thank Always you. Happy to share. <laughs> well, and you're all, to the extent that you care to be involved in this conversation moving forward, you are most welcome. Yeah, there's some smart, smart folks. Let's learn from here. Mm -hmm. There are all of these comments. I think you've been reading the chat of, of uh, great synergy between all participants. Thanks for a wonderful program. Um, really appreciate your time and bringing this to the group today. Um, and yes. I think folks should not feel shy at this point about unmuting and chiming in <laughs> with yes. other questions. Please, if you have anything to say, and I think you all have the ability to, to save the chat. Um, so feel free to do that. And Andrea, you should save the chat because you can read all the lovely things that people have said about you. I just did. Thanks for telling me Good. that. that <laughs> it's not always permitted. No, it, we keep things open. Um, as totally open as we worth can. canceling my office hours for, by the way. Oh, <laughs> well, we also, you can always share this, the recording with your students because it will be public and online on the nasasitside.gmri.org website soon. We have to do a little cleanup and then it'll be posted. Of course. Yeah. I was just going to say hi. I haven't seen you in a long time. It's lovely to see you. It's so long. I, know. <laughs> I still think about that wayward paper that we were going to yeah, write today. <laughs> it's still there in my head. You're going to make us all make you write it. How's Nebraska treating you, Andrea? It's, it's pretty good overall. I mean, institutions are institutions and They've all got their fun stuff to deal with. Um, but, you know, the living's pretty easy in the middle of the Midwest. And and I got tenure, so that's nice. That's <laughs> Congratulations, Congratulations on that, by the way. Yeah, I just got made program director for our PhD program, which is not a favor. Um, so <laughs> that's a new learning process for me. I it may be a lot of work ahead of you, but I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of PhD students will benefit. So 
I hope so. It's good. Because it is a lot of work. I mean, talk about admin efforts. Holy cow. <laughs> did, did they, did, uh, how, uh, can you answer, Kare? I mean, honestly, uh, Andrea, did they, how much did they count your efforts, a tremendous amount of effort toward citizen science projects? Oh, for, for tenure? For tenure. 100%. This is, um, I would say I had something like 22 journal articles on my CV and something like 13 or so were in biology and ecology and all those all counted. Um, the impact factors are way higher <laughs> than some of my own fields journals top out at as well. So, you know, that, that tends to like make people's eyes get big. Um, but I think um, my university values applied scholarship. Um, and community engagement is a, is a big priority because it is a metropolitan university and we serve the students who aren't going to be able to go to an R1 because they can't afford it because their family situation is such that, you know, they need to be around um, because we have way more students with disabilities than I've seen on any other campus I've ever been on. So we kind of serve that next tier of students who are very talented, very hardworking, no privilege to to speak of and um and i find that like really rewarding in itself but as a as a campus kind of the the ethos is that we want to do stuff that has impact and the way my college looks at it impact is very broadly construed and so they're pretty happy with people who are just doing productive stuff that gets any kind of attention and having courses that are that involve service learning is a good metric or a good uh, marker of that but yeah, the Community Engagement Center is one of the like shiniest, nicest buildings right in the middle of our main campus. Um, and we have a, like, there's a service learning academy where they teach faculty how to do service learning and they provide direct support. Um, so um, this semester, I, I have in the past kind of like recruited loosely from citizen science projects for data sets that my students can work with in this data analysis course. And it's a lot of overhead to do that. And so I asked the service learning folks if they could help me find a partner. And so they found Heartland Family Service who has provided data on 500 clients using their mental health and counseling services, um, properly de-identified per HIPAA requirements. Um, and that adds up to be 8,800 rows of data because it's people who have had multiple visits over time. And the fascinating thing to me was when the students asked for the standard billing rates for the different services um because they were curious about kind of the how how the time shakes out into financial numbers and stuff like that they shared that too because they're a nonprofit and they have education as part of their mission that was sixty-two thousand rows <laughs> which i think just like made everybody's face fall to the ground um because we're gonna have to really do some work to use any of that information the the, the challenge is basically like different billing rates for different providers and qualifications and services, and then for every different insurer, which is crazy. Sounds like an interesting data set. Yeah. Andrea, that, that question that Harrell is asking though, that, or at least one of the things that I heard in there is that it, this work, the citizen science work is not necessarily academically productive for all academics. I don't mean to be reading too much into that, Harrell, but Andrea, yeah. you published on that. I think the time to publication, you mentioned that loosely, can be longer than other ways of doing research. Absolutely. I mean, there are some mixed incentive issues, right? Um, and so I kind of positioned myself at an institution that incentivizes and cares about some of those outcomes, but a lot of them might not. And so there's the you, you're in a defensive position about the quality of the work that you're doing and why this instead of something else. And that is an unfortunate setup because it kind of undermines some of the most impactful stuff we can do. Um, one of the things that I think has paid off very, very well for me is that I have prioritized open access publication. Um, and so that shows up in citations. So even if they don't wanna give a lot of credit to the work in itself, if they didn't, the citation rates kind of reflect that people find this useful. And so I think that is one way to kind of make that argument, but timelines and stuff like that do not always line up. Um, and sometimes the institution is a tough ship to turn in terms of reconsidering what really matters. Um, I see a lot more push from like AGU and various groups to 
actually really engage in science communication. And I feel like whatever has happened to us collectively over the past, say, five or six years, um, has really gone to show how important the science communication work is um, for our ongoing kind of funding and support from the public. Um, and so I think there are arguments that could be made, but it is unfortunately one of those things that we all have to fight these battles um, unless you manage to land yourself in a nice position where, it, where people just actually accept it. Open access is interesting, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I should take off and get to my classroom so I can get everything set up for the next round. Um, Thank you so much lovely. for squishing us Thank between you. your two classes. It was, was really a fabulous conversation. And good Thank to you. see some faces. It's delightful. <laughs> Thank you.